NPR journalist Steve Inskeep was able to secure an interview with former President Donald Trump in January. We're not going to air the short interview, which is bizarre in and of itself. Instead, I want to talk about the letter that NPR sent to affiliate stations about the interview with Trump. NPR leadership was worried that the listeners would be traumatized upon hearing Trump's voice on the radio. So NPR sent advice to stations about how to handle potential outrage by listeners. The letter is called, quote, customizable listener letter for use by stations. Inskeep Trump interview 112 2022. Okay, here's what the letter says. The below communication may be helpful to your audience responses. As always, feel free to send audience members with questions and concerns about NPR directly to us or go to npr.org forward slash contact. Dear listener, as a national news organization, one of NPR's core duties is to report on and present points of view that impact political realities in the United States. Donald Trump is the former president and leader of the Republican Party. His statements and actions are influential. The NPR reporting you'll hear on WXXX, just insert whatever the affiliate station is, is extensive, and of course, some stories and voices will be controversial. Audience members can expect to encounter a broad variety of coverage across NPR's platform. And here's the the punchline. NPR remains dedicated to holding powerful people accountable by asking them direct questions with the goal of presenting them fairly... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and in context with fact checking <laughs> with fact checking and analysis NPR's coverage decisions are made by NPR's newsroom leaders in line with comprehensive ethics guidelines more information can be found in the ethics handbook blah 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 you can contact NPR's office of the public editor blah 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 uh, the public editor's independent media blah 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 sincerely xxx okay so um what do you what do you think about that? That they're giving people basically, they're giving affiliate stations a kind of roadmap for what happens when their listeners are traumatized by hearing the former president's voice. Yeah, I'm wondering is what that says about how NPR feels about its listeners, yeah. or is it more that they're afraid of the blowback from actually even reporting anything that the president says, and they're afraid what the listeners are going to say or complain about to the station. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it's I- interesting that you, you, you're you giving people a warning. It's almost as if they're cultivating a sense of fragility. In or them. they assume it. Yeah, they, they, they assume it. And maybe they assume it for good reason, because the NPR listeners have become increasingly fragile, of which causally they played some role in the first place. I love this idea that NPR remains dedicated to holding powerful people accounting accountable by asking them direct questions. In no segment that I have heard and in no segment that we've done has that ever been the case. Yeah, we've been yet to experience that. I I spent hundreds of hours listening to NPR, inflicting brain damage on myself for you, the listeners, and I have not heard that once. But, But listen to the rest of it. With the goal of presenting them fairly and in the in context with fact-checking and analysis. Yet to see any of that. I've yet to see any of that. In fact, not only is there no fact-checking analysis, there's not even an expert on the other side. That's one of the things I've, I've learned from listening to hundreds of hours of this, if not more at this point. And that is, instead of finding an expert to talk about something that runs counter to the narrative, they'll find people who already buy into it and ask them what the other side thinks, and a straw man is created, and then they'll savage that. But only always. But Correct. And so the addition of that w- was particularly crazy to me. It just makes me wonder about the mental state of people who, who write this stuff and who believe this stuff. I wonder if being sheltered from the opposing point of view for years and years could do that to you. Yeah, it creates an actual kind of fragility. So then when you hear, you don't even have to hear the argument. You just have to hear his voice. Right. You hear his voice and you're somehow traumatized as a consequence of that. But the, 
I, I mean, I mean, the whole thing is so deranged. I don't even know where to go with it at this point. That letter NPR felt obliged to write in order to justify having a former president on its airwaves has nothing to do with this next story we're about to do, and yet it does. NPR claims they hold powerful people accountable by asking direct questions and having fact-based conversations, and yet we know that's not true. Yeah, it's total, total, totally false. So let's take a look at a story. Before, before we start, I'm going to just give you some background to contextualize this. Uh, Levine is an American pediatrician and a four-star admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corp. She's a U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health. So Levine was also named as one of USA Today's Women of the Year in 2022, which recognizes women who have made a significant impact. How long has she been a woman? Uh, well, 11 years. For 11, she transitioned in 2011. She also uses WPATH, World Professional Association for Trans Health, as a source for many a lot of the information about transgender care. The organization has been criticized, and we can put links in the YouTube channel. Okay, let's take a listen. Admiral Rachel Levine, the highest-ranking transgender official in U.S. history, will give a speech in Texas tomorrow. Levine is the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health. She'll be speaking at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, where she will urge medical students to fight political attacks against trans young people and their families. NPR's Selena Simmons-Stuffin got an exclusive look at the prepared remarks and sat down with Levine before she flew to Texas. All over the country, from Idaho to Arizona, lawmakers are introducing bills that target trans kids. Notice how this is framed as a political attack. It's explicitly a political attack. Target. Makes you think like somebody's being hunted. Right. They limit their access to health care or sports or what can be talked about at school. Limit their access to health care? No. They're talking about what we'll talk about, gender-affirming surgery, Sports, yeah, they're talking about one particular type of sports, people who are born male, at some stage of maybe transition or self-identification, choose to go into female sports. So already, we're, we're looking at something that's just not, not accurate. This could all, of course, be solved if you had a voice on the other side. We'll see if they do. <laughs> I'm not a political person, right? I'm a physician, and my focus is on medicine and public health. In her office at the headquarters of the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., Admiral Rachel Levine talked about her decision to go to Texas and take a stand against what she calls disturbing and dangerous laws. In her prepared remarks, she notes the lawmakers who write these bills reference scientific studies and use medical terms to justify them. She writes, quote, the language of medicine and science is being used to drive people to suicide. The mantle of concern for children is being claimed to destroy children's lives. So I, I just want to say. That's a big claim. Yeah. That's a big claim. Yeah, it, it's a big claim. And, and we see this all the time now. Follow the science. What's the science? What's the evidence? But the fact is, not only are those bodies of literature, those journals, corrupt, but they're primarily used for ideological purposes to do exactly what they said in the beginning for political attacks. Well, I think in her case, she might actually be referencing the actual medical studies of which there have been plenty that show that some of, some of what she's advocating for could be dangerous for young people. And she doesn't want that literature included or want that language included. But if you don't want the language of science and you don't want the language of medicine when we're talking about a basically a medical issue... What language would she like? We have to take a firmer stand on behalf of those who are being hurt. Trans youth need to be supported. They need to be affirmed. There we go again. They need to be affirmed. I I don't know anybody that doesn't believe in supporting trans youth. Again, that's not the argument. The argument is how do we support trans youth? How how is what is the best way to help young people who are going through gender dysphoria? That's what the conversation is about. Yeah. uh, And she's framing that conversation as anybody that doesn't agree with the particular stance that she has is attacking trans people uh, as if it as if they they want to impose some kind of violence on them. Yeah. And those arguments are nuanced. For example, Helen Joyce is an author uh, who writes about that rather extensively. But nobody's uh, 
nobody's attacking. This isn't an attack on people who need help. No. Conversations about whether or not we give kids who haven't even gone through puberty yet certain drugs that will affect them for the rest of their life. And that's a serious conversation to have. It's a medical conversation. It's going to involve data. It's going to involve evidence. It's going to involve studies. And if she doesn't want that brought in there, then what does that really say about her position? That's the kind of conversation we should right. be having. It, it, I'll tell you what it says about her position is that it lacks legitimacy and right. no one will trust it. That's what it says. That's part of the legitimacy crisis, the crisis of legitimation. We just don't trust authorities, whether it's on vaccinations, whether no matter what, what, what it is. And this is a contributory variable to this. It's an, one manifestation of the legitimacy crisis. They need to be empowered. Texas is a pointed setting for this speech. The state has investigated the parents of trans kids. Families have moved out of the state because they felt unsafe. And the state attorney... Unsafe. There's the word again. That's the lingo. General recently attacked Levine herself on Twitter. I take my feelings about that and I put it into my advocacy and our policy work. On the policy side... I'm not sure what her feelings have to do with anything, but okay. Levine lists actions the Biden administration is taking to support trans youth. And on the advocacy side... I just... I, okay. I just have this idea of supporting trans youth. That is just not what this is about. Well, what does it even mean? I mean, so far we've heard, I mean, half the clip is over, and I have no idea what, what the actual legislation yeah. is, what, what she, there's been yeah. no, what, what there's nothing in What does that mean to there. support trans youth? Yeah. Is that, I think I told you when, when my, my son was uh, 16, he wanted his hair colored at mm -hmm. the, the barbershop down here in Portland, and he had to have a note from his parents. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd like to know what, what, uh, what that means. And I'd specifically like to know what it entails in addition to knowing what it means. Levine wants to educate people about sex and gender. For some people, they fear what they don't understand. And for some people, I think that these issues of gender identity are beyond their experience. And so... That's all true. Everything she said was just true. A lot of people fear what they don't understand beyond people's experiences. No problem. I guess what's... what. What reasonable inference can a reasonable person make from that? They don't understand it, and so they fear it. According to a Pew survey True. last year, more than half of Americans think that whether someone is a man or a woman is fixed at birth. Most people also say they don't know anyone who's trans. Levine says she knows most... Boy, I know so many people who are trans. I actually rolled at the gym well, last time. Yeah. Someone was trans. Well, we I live know. in Portland, so that, that's yeah. part of it. Yeah. People's experience of gender is as a simple binary. It is actually much more complicated. You know, there is sex. You might think that that is simple, but it, it is not. And then there's gender. Gender is really that self-concept um, in terms of your gender that is also multidimensional. There is also sexual orientation and gender roles and more. It's all complicated, Levine explains. When it comes to the appropriate treatment for trans people... There is a standard of care, an evidence-based standard of care. Evidence-based. Interesting. The people who turn to subjective epistemology, standpoint epistemology, are now suddenly concerned with evidence. But they're only concerned with evidence if it supports their narrative. For the evaluation and treatment of trans individuals. Um, that standard is set by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. That standard is up uh, so the example of postmodernism blurring the boundaries of critical theory and complicating it, we'll put a link in the uh, YouTube uh, description. Updated as more research comes in, she explains, the same way doctors update whether or not to prescribe an aspirin a day for older people or how best to manage someone's diabetes. Really? She's equated something which there's broad agreement for with something for which there's not broad agreement for. The, the WPATH, World Professional Association of Trans Health, has been criticized by a lot of people in the medical community, and you wouldn't know that from hearing her. And these kind of conversations and this kind of science, quote unquote, is far from settled. Right. And there's nations like Sweden and other nations in Scandinavia who have pulled back from giving some of these drugs to young kids because, number one, we're not 100% sure what the long-term benefits or, or harm could be. Yeah. And, um, yeah. It, 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 sorry to interrupt. So she yeah. just said that the standards come from WPATH. Right. She Part of the problem, source. there's no stigma around, or there's no political, I don't know, uh, 
stigma around researching aspirin and heart attack, old people, young people, but there is a um, convergence of a dominant of of a suite of dominant orthodoxies which prevent researching something which is not morally fashionable. Well, for sure, right. because then they're going to say you're attacking trans youth. Exactly. And you're not. You're not you supporting. Hate tra you're trans transphobe. You hate trans people. Yeah, you're 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 encouraging suicide. There's gonna there's all these heavy accusations she's throwing out there that really have nothing to do with the conversation that's actually occurring in a medical community. And I'd encourage people to to do their own research and to take a look. And we'll have some links below that they can look at. But. Right. You know, this is far from, from settled as far as what you should and shouldn't do with a 10 or 11 year old who feels they have gender dysphoria. It's a and serious conversation. It's a medical conversation. Yeah, um, and f feelings don't have anything to do with it. It's what's the evidence, how is, what's the methodology for the studies. Uh, okay, let's keep listening. But importantly, she says, there is no scientific debate when it comes to the big picture. There is no argument. Really? about the value and the importance of gender-affirming care. There is no argument. So that's 100% dishonest. Th what? There's no argument about it. There's no argument that everybody wants to help, help kids or anybody else who feels they have gender dysphoria. Correct. There's no argument about that. How do you do it? That's what the argument's about. Do we give puberty-blocking drugs to young boys or young girls who feel that they have gender dysphoria before they go through puberty that's and have life-altering effects? That there's no argument. That's, but that's the question. That's a big question that's being prevented from being had, partially because of people like Rachel Levine, and she's framing it as if that question doesn't even exist. So it's, it's a, it's yeah, a shell guess, game here. She's, she's done a Mott and Bailey where she switched, yeah. she switched it up. I, I guess if you only hung out with people who believe exactly what you do and they in your little ideological pond yeah i guess there would be no disagreement if the, if the only thing i ever heard about trans issues i heard from npr then i would agree with that statement but if i was a doctor i would know better all right let's keep going gender affirming care is not harmful it's life-saving she explains and it's based on decades of research so th there you go again and so pe people often would say to me maybe this is just my own stick, but you know, people say, well, why does it matter that we have ideological diversity in institution? Why, why does it matter that, that we have different people with, you know, either different starting assumptions or they uh, have certain views that are, are heterodox? Well, one of the reasons that matters is because if there's a convergence of opinion in the scientific community, for example, on anthropogenic global warming, if there's a convergence of opinion of, of, of scientific consensus and those people come from, they have different political commitments or no political commitments. The research is likely to be taken uh, more as a matter of fact and less as an ideological presentation of an idea if the people are all over the ideological spectrum. That's the idea of having Supreme Court justices with different views elected by different presidents. But that's simply not what we have now. I asked Levine if it's exhausting explaining her own experiences and answering questions about gender all the time. Okay, exhausting explaining your own experience. Your experiences might be important for you, and I'm sure they are, but we're talking about science. We're talking about medicine. We're talking about policy positions based upon the best available evidence. Feelings are completely irrelevant. Now, that could be one question You know, is she? Ex I, I suppose if you were trans, it would be exhausting to talk about it all the time. I don't think that's an appropriate take question. The, take huh? the politics out of it for a second. What are we actually talking about? We're talking about giving medical drugs to children. That's really what the debate's about, right? And she said that there's no, that there's mountains. She presents it as if there's mountains of data that that's a good idea. In reality, it's the opposite. And there has been a study. Um, that was exposed as being quite shoddy. You can look that up. And, and a lot of the medical community is coming around and believing that the harm outweighs the good when What's it comes the study? to the, you know, we'll put it in the comments. Yeah, we'll have it in the comments there. Um, but I believe that's just one and it's poorly done. And we can contrast that with a lot of other evidence that's come back so far yeah, and, the, and, and, and has the, shown it's dangerous. Right. And, and, and again, this is not about my opinion or your opinion. No. This is about not only the issue, but it's about NPR. I, I want to I bring you back to what they said before. Remember that letter, that letter that we just read? In that letter, NPR officials write, and I quote, 
NPR remains dedicated to holding powerful people accountable by asking them direct questions with the goal of presenting them fairly and in context with fact-checking and analysis. Rachel Levine is the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health. She's a powerful person. There were no challenges from NPR. None. Zero. Right. That is not what they're doing. It is dishonest. And what are the potential consequences if she's wrong? I can't. I mean. So here in Portland, in Portland Public Schools now, you'll have a sizable percentage of young girls who identify as trans now. And we know from the data that most of them will outgrow that. Some will be lesbians, some will be straight. Abigail Schreier's irreversible damage, it's there. It's also in the Denver Soros. Yeah, but if you you start providing a medical treatment uh, that's irreversible before some of those things happen, or you don't take into account that the child might also have depression or a whole host of other factors besides gender dysphoria. Yeah. And that is a serious medical conversation and debate that's going on right now. I would tell you that the evidence is on the other side of this, that we should be a little more cautious when it comes to providing and, this and kind of And it doesn't even matter, ultimately, well, ultimately it does, but it doesn't matter where the evidence, it's not your job. No. To, it's not my job. Why are we doing this? We're doing because this because NPR they haven't it. brought up the questions. Right. They haven't asked the hard questions. Right. So we're doing it. And anybody who listens to this, especially after that, you know, we ask hard questions, you know, we hold powerful people. No, you actually don't. You're telling people that, you're forwarding a narrative, you're doing a disservice. You are fundamentally dishonest. Right. You're yeah. lying to people. The way the story is being presented is fundamentally dishonest. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, let's hear the rest. It's fine. It, it doesn't bother me. You know, I've been in these positions for seven, eight years now, and so it doesn't surprise me. She understands that as part of her role, to use her position and her visibility as an open and proud transgender woman, she says, to support vulnerable communities in all ways. Vulnerable communities. There it is again. That she can. Selena Simmons-Duffin, NPR News. Yeah, so... I feel like we have to explain a little bit about what the actual debate and conversation is about because this is such a misleading and and poor interview that that people are going to be completely misled if they don't know. And I would offer this. Imagine you have a child and your child has some form of gender dysphoria or as they're as they're getting older, they start to believe that maybe they were born in the wrong body or they're a, a girl who feels they're a boy or vice versa. Do we want that child to be given irreversible medical treatment, surgical and, and hormonal and Often, all kinds of other things Andrew that, can, that says, can have effects for the rest of their life right. without even being consulted, because that's what's going on in some states um, where the parents aren't informed of that, or, or to be, have it pushed on them without having someone also stop and say, well, there might be other issues, or maybe when the, in two or three or four right. years that they'll grow out of it because and, the data shows that they right. do. And whose job is that? Is that your job? No. No, but it's, I think it's most, Americans, most Americans would 100% agree that that seems to be the sensible route to take. Right. That's not an extreme position. That's not a position that says you hate trans people. It's not a position that says you want, you want trans kids to kill themselves. It's actually right. the opposite. And, and I don't know if more trans kids kill themselves after transition or before transition, but I'd like to see some studies on that. And a lot of this data and a lot of this conversation is not happening because the stigma that's applied to it uh, and the, the accusations that if you even have the conversation, you must somehow be hate trans people right. that come from, where does that stigma come from? It comes from episodes like this on NPR. Exactly, 100%. So 100%. this, again, at the end of the day, is, in my opinion, dangerous misinformation. Yeah, and why has Sweden, for example, cha- changed cha- changed uh, its course with puberty blockers? Or Finland. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can talk about what the science is unequivocally. And, and, and I think that there is, uh, unlike the, the, the piece when there's no debate, everybody agrees, I think that's insane. I, I, don't mean, think, I don't think most parents, most American citizens even know what's going on. They don't even know about this debate because they're not allowed to hear it. Right. And if you, if you get your news primarily from NPR, you're not going to know actually what's going on. You're going to be terribly misinformed about what's actually happening. And that's not good. Yeah, and it's not it has good a real you. consequence. For the country. It has real consequences for the lives of children. I think my fear personally, having looked into this just a little bit, is that in 10 or 15 years, we're going to have a lot of unhappy young young people yeah. 
um, who've gone through changes that they might otherwise regret because this kind of thing was pushed way too fast. And I, th I, I think it's a serious conversation to have, whether you agree with that position or not. I think we should all, we would all agree it's a conversation that should be had. And Rachel Levine doesn't seem to want that conversation to be had. And that's not good. Y yes. And I'll add one more thing. Uh, NPR has covered zero goose egg, nothing, nothing. Stories about the growing community of detransitioners. And I don't want you to believe anything Matt says. I don't want you to believe anything I no, say. I data. would like you to Google that yourself and look, NPR stories, detransitioners, or, or what have you. So we have multiple issues here. Uh, NPR is not doing what it says of holding powerful people accountable. They're pushing narratives. Uh, they're doing people a disservice. Uh, you, you made a I'm gonna make a prediction. I'm going to make a prediction. I don't know when this is going to come about, but I'm going to predict this ideology is so ghastly that the gaslighting at the end of the day will be epic because no one will want to admit that no, they advocated for the deny, mutilation they, oh, of, the, of child's, yeah. of ch the genitals we of children. We weren't pushing that it's on so people. It's so ghastly. There's no doubt about it. And again, nobody, virtually, shouldn't say nobody, virtually nobody cares if you want to transition and you're 18. If, no. if you're 18 and you want to transition... There's no, there, that's not what we're talking no, about. it's not what the conversation's about. That's right. So another example of NPR having failed its Look up listeners. the data. If you look up at the data on any given topic on your own, if you take an hour, two hours to actually study and look at some of these studies on, on this or pretty much any other episode that NPR airs, I have a feeling you'll stop listening to NPR. And we don't, just to be clear again of what we want. We want it to change. Yeah, we want it to change. We don't want NPR to be defunded. We want it to be a source that we can all count on, that we can all rely upon, that we can all go to. We want it to do what they actually say that they're going to do. Imagine a conversation. Imagine us listening to an episode from NPR where we had two medical doctors on. Yeah. One who was presenting the evidence and the data for why they think we need to go a little slower or you need to be careful about giving kids these drugs before they go through puberty and one who thought it was a good idea and we could hear that data and we could hear that evidence from medical prof Imagine that conversation. That should be the conversation that's going on with taxpayer funded NPR. Right, 100%. Right. Thank you for watching this excerpt from an episode of All Things Reconsidered. To watch the full episode, please follow the link in the description. <laughs>